I am really, really excited to be able to be with you in your first Alaska Conference virtual camp meeting. So this is a historic moment uh, for your conference and for all of us as we try to make sense out of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we have been going through. Uh, but I want you to know that it is an honor for me to be able to be with you during this very special time to share God's word with you during this standing before your throne camp meeting. I want to especially thank Pastor Kevin Miller, your president, and Melvin Santos, your secretary, Jim Jensen, your treasurer, and my friend uh, Tobin Dosh is your youth director and your uh, church planting director, Tandy Perks. Uh, she used to work right here with us at the North American Division, and you guys took her to Alaska. Uh, I want to thank my friends, and each one of you affirm the pastors of the Alaska Conference for the great work that they do on a regular basis. So thank you so much for the invitation to share with you and with my brothers and sisters in Alaska during this very special time. And uh, before we go anywhere else, I would like to ask you to just uh, write down on the chat, whether you're on Facebook, uh, YouTube, or, or Zoom, just write down on the chat your name and where you're watching us from, because we like to know where you're watching us from. Uh, but uh, I want to say this. When you get an invitation to Alaska, you always say yes. As a matter of fact, I have never said no to an invitation from Alaska, not even in January. Last time I was there, it was January. It was a bit cold. And it was dark uh, for a big part of the day, and I enjoyed it a lot. I thought it was beautiful. This year, I was supposed to be with you for your ministry's convention, then for camp meeting, and then for a visit that we were going to do uh, to some of the villages as we uh, partner with the North Pacific Union, the Alaska Conference, and the North American Division to see how we can reach some of your uh, villages uh, better in, uh, in Alaska. Uh, but uh, due to COVID-19, we, we're not able to do so. And that is the reason why I am coming to you virtually even though I would much rather be with you in person right now. Let me tell you, you live in one of the most beautiful places on earth. And if I can just mention a few of the beauties that I, uh, of Alaska, the Denali National Park, uh, your wildlife, uh, for you is normal. But for, for some of us that don't get to see it all the time, the bears and the moose and the whales and, and the salmon, uh, swimming upstream, uh, just just amazing. Uh, I can only imagine the, the nature right now, uh, vegetation during the summer, the glaciers, the, the Gulf of Alaska, some of your cities, Anchorage and Juneau and Fairbanks and, and Nome, uh, with a combination of contemporary uh, and the last frontier feel uh, to them, and of course, the northern lights. Wow. You live in one of the most beautiful and amazing places on earth. You are so blessed. But I want to make one thing clear. What is most beautiful about all of Alaska, and I could even go a little bit beyond that and say what God loves most uh, about all of Alaska is not the northern lights or your uh, green vegetation during this time or the Denali National Park or, or your wildlife or the or the whales on the on the Gulf of in the Gulf of Alaska. Let me let me make this clear. What's most beautiful and what God loves most about Alaska is you. Ha! Ah, that's right, you and your family and your friends and your co-workers and the people, the native people of Alaska. Uh, it is not a coincidence. I want to make it clear. It is not a coincidence that God has placed you there because he has put you there that you might be able to be his hands and his eyes and his heart and his feet to the people who live around you in Alaska. God wants to reach the people of Alaska through you. Amen. And that is the reason why, as we get ready to open our Bibles, I would like to, to pray that we might be able to ask for the presence of God to stay with us as we continue sharing together during this beautiful virtual camp meeting, standing before your throne. Let's pray. Dear Holy Spirit, I want to ask you to be with me right now. I want to ask you to bless me in a very special way. I am a sinner. 
I do not deserve to be used by you, but thanks to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, our sins are forgiven and we have access to you. And I want to thank you for that. So Holy Spirit, I want to ask you to use me in a very special way today. And I want to ask for a double portion, double portion of your spirit to all of my brothers and sisters and friends who are watching in Alaska or wherever they might be. Bless us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. A few months ago, as we were still allowed to travel, I was about to board a red-eye flight. You guys know what a red-eye flight is. It's a flight all the way from the west coast to the east coast. You take off late at night and you land here early in the morning those your eyes are red because you hardly slept all night so i was about to catch one of those as soon as i boarded uh, right there at the lax uh, los angeles international airport i noticed that the person that would be sitting next to me was already on her seat and uh, as soon as i took my seat i said well let me see if i can um, say hello introduce myself i always like to do that uh, but that wasn't my plan. I wasn't planning to talk all night. I just wanted to say hello, uh, put my headphones on, and go to sleep because I knew it was going to be a long night. Before I even got to say hello to the person that was next to me, I could hear her making some noises. You, you, you know how it is when someone just falls to sleep right, very soundly right next to you and they begin to snore uh, loud and she was just snoring really loud. So I said, well, uh, I guess this could be a long night, not because I have to have some conversation with the person next to me, but because of these noises that she's making. So right away I went to my noise canceling uh, headphones. I have some headphones that I use them when traveling. I put them on and turn them on and it cancels the sound around me so I don't hear a thing. So I put them on to realize that uh, the battery the battery was gone. I said no problem let me connect the battery to the input right underneath my seat and the battery will charge quickly but then when I connected the, the headphones uh, to the uh, to the input underneath my seat, I realized that the input, the electricity wasn't working. So I had to put my headphones away and say, okay, it's going to be a long night. The flight took off. The lady continued to make all of those noises and she snored all night. Finally, as we were, get, were getting ready to land in Washington, D.C., the lady woke up and without too much protocol. She just woke up, looked at me, and she said, oh, hi. I said, hi. And next thing she asked me, what do you do? I said, well, I'm, I'm a minister. And without much more, she said, what denomination? And I said, Seventh-day Adventist. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, yeah, I know you guys. You guys are, you are, the, you guys are the, the people that don't eat meat. You're all vegetarian. Ah, I looked at her and I tried to explain that that some of us are, that there are others who are not, that being vegetarian is not a require, requirement to, to join our church for baptism. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I explained to her that there were other things. I talked about our hospital health uh, system. Uh, I talked to her about the blue zones. I don't know if you knew that, but Adventists in North America, uh, in the United States, we live longer about 10 years longer than, than the rest of the population. Uh, so I tried to talk to her about that. I talked to her about uh, Adventist Community Services, about ADRA. Uh, I even threw in Ben Carson because I did, didn't want her to just know all of us just for being vegetarians. When I mentioned the name of Ben Carson, that did not go over well. Uh, she didn't seem to be a Republican. She said, have you heard what he did recently? And by the tone in her voice, I could tell that she was not impressed. And by the look in her eyes, so I, I moved from that topic very quickly. 
well, we have a great uh, school system, and we have a, our school system is second to, to, to just about none uh, across the world. We're, uh, we are very well organized, and, and I uh, tried to talk to her about some of the other things that we as Seventh-day Adventists have going for us. But as she was ready to exit the plane, she looked at me one more time, and she said, well, you may have a lot of other things going for you, but when you said that you were a Seventh-day Adventist, the first thing that came to my mind was vegetarians. When I hear the word Seventh-day Adventist, when I hear the word Adventist, the first thing that comes to my mind, and she repeated, was they are vegetarian. And then she walked away. I, I, I tried to follow her. Uh, to see if I could continue the conversation and convince her that we were a lot more than just vegetarians. But she walked away quickly. And as she walked away, I could not shake this conversation out of my head. So now I have a question for you. When people in your city, in your neighborhood, when they hear the word Adventist, what is the first thing that comes to their mind? The other day I was, uh, tell me, tell me, what is the first thing that comes to their mind? Uh, please write it down on the chat. Write it down on the chat, whether you're watching on YouTube, on Zoom, whether you're watching on Facebook, just write it down. When people in your city, when people in your neighborhood, when they hear the word Adventist, what is the first thing that comes to their mind? When your friends not Adventist friends, when they hear the word Adventist, what is the first thing that comes to their mind? Write it down. Thank you. Just the other day, I was, I was walking right here in my neighborhood, walking my dog. Uh, so now, uh, during COVID-19, I have been able to, to see on a regular basis a lot of my neighbors that I don't get to see uh, regularly when I'm traveling. Yeah, so I'm walking my dog around, and I see my, my friend and my neighbor. Uh, his name is Daryl. And, and he started talking to me, and he knows that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I have mentioned it, mentioned it to him before. And, and he was talking about a church that is nearby to, to our neighborhood. The, actually, the church is right in our neighborhood, um, less than a mile away from my home. And he was talking about the great job that they're doing, giving away food to people that have uh, been left without jobs uh, during this season. And he said, man, you guys, you Adventists, you are such good people. Uh, I could see myself being a part of you. The one thing that I have a hard time with and that I don't think I could ever be would be a vegetarian. Ah, so even my neighbor, my neighbor, when he thinks about Adventists, the first thing that comes to his mind is that we are vegetarian. So the, the, this, the lady in the plane, now my neighbor right here, right in my community, uh, saying pretty much the same thing. That has kept me thinking. And as I think about this, I have come to some conclusions. And listen up. Listen to me. I think it is important that we, that we talk about these things. I have come to the conclusion that I don't want our church. I don't want my church to be a church that is only known for our diet. I don't want the Seventh-day Adventist church, I don't want my church, your church, our church, to be a church that is only known for our hospitals. I don't, want, I don't want my church, I don't want your church, I don't want our church to be a church that is only known because we live longer lives than everybody else. I don't even want my church to be known for, uh, only known for Ben Carson. And please don't stone me yet. Uh, I'm about to say something that perhaps may shock some of you, but I don't even want my church, our church, to be known only known for Ellen G. White, our writer and our prophet and our pioneer. You see, when I think about what I would like my church, our church, to be known for, I believe that I would like and I would love my church to be known for, for the things that Jesus wanted our church to be known for, for the things that Jesus wanted me and you to be known for. That is what I would like our church to be known for. And what is that? Let's go to our Bibles. Let's go to our Bibles. And I uh, want to take you to the uh, Gospel of John, uh, chapter 13, 
verses 34 and 35. And this is written in red in my Bible. And here Jesus says what he would like people to know us for. And it says there, John 13, 34 and 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, listen up, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. You see, Jesus in his infinite wisdom, he could have said, and I would love people to, to know that, uh, that you are my disciples because of uh, the Sabbath. When they see you going to church on Sabbath, they will know that you are my disciples. But for some reason, and Sabbath is really important. And it's really awesome to be able to go to church on Sabbath. Actually, to go to the temple on Sabbath. We are the church wherever we are. And now that we cannot go to the building, we're still the church where we are. So even though it is beautiful to worship God on the Sabbath, in his infinite wisdom, Jesus did not say that they will know that you are my disciples because you worship on the Sabbath. In, in his infinite wisdom, he, he could have said, and when they see you reading the Bible, and I love reading my Bible, it is how I know about God's love for me and for you. Uh, th there is nothing that can replace reading the Bible. But Jesus did not say, in his infinite wisdom, he did not say, when they see you reading your Bibles, they will know that you're my disciples. I love prayer, but, but Jesus did not say, when they see you praying, they will know that you are my disciples. There is nothing better than prayer. It's our way of talking to God. And so I love prayer, but Jesus, for some reason, in his infinite wisdom, did not say, and they will know that you are my disciples when they see you praying. Jesus in his infinite wisdom, he said, By these all men and all women will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And I want to say this. I want to say this. And I, please, please pay attention to what I'm saying here because it is really important. The best way to know our love for God and our faithfulness for God is by loving others. Let me go even a little bit beyond that and say that the unique characteristic, the unique distinctive characteristic of a disciple of Jesus is not the Sabbath. It's not that we read our Bibles. It's not that we pray. The unique distinctive characteristic of a disciple of Jesus is that we have love for others. And if you have a problem with that, you need to be able to talk to Jesus about that because he's the one who said it. They will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Actually, uh, not only that, but the unique characteristic of the redeemed on the second coming is very similar to the unique characteristic of the disciples of Jesus. If we go to Matthew 25, 30. 1 through 40, it says there very clearly, it says it very clearly that there will be a group to the right, a group to the left, and that Jesus will say to the group on the right, for as much as you did it to the least of this, as much as you love the, the least of this, you love me, you did it unto me. So not only the disciples, uh, not only the redeemed, but let me go even beyond that, the distinct characteristic the distinct characteristic of God is also love. Because it says right there in the Bible that whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. 1 John 4 and 8. So my dear brothers and sisters in Alaska, I want to make it clear. The distinctive characteristic of a disciple of Jesus is not the Sabbath. It's not his dress or her dress. It's not his or her diet. It's not his taste of music or her, her taste of music. Uh, it is the love that we have for others. Jesus said it. They will know. They will know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. If people don't see us as a community of love. They will never accept us as a community of faith, and as a community, as a community, let me make it clear, as a community of hope.
So if people don't see us as a community of love, they will never accept us as a community of faith. They will never accept us as a community of hope. And it is really important that we understand this. Let me see how I can put it, that I can make it a little bit clearer to each and every one of us. Let me see. An Adventist, a Christian who does not love others, is like a day without sun. Well, I, I don't think that 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 made it any clearer because you guys in Alaska have days without sun. So let me let me try again. A Christian, a Seventh Day Adventist who does not love others, is like a car without wheels. That's that's it. A Christian, a Seventh Day Adventist that that does not love others, is like a car without wheels. Is like a school without a teacher. Is like Mount Denali without the snow at the top. Is is like the ocean without any fish. It's like it's like a meal without rice and beans. Ha! That's that's for me and uh, for most of you, or for perhaps for some of you, it could be a meal without salmon. Uh, it is like football without the Patriots and and like the Patriots without Tom Brady. Ha! That's it. A Christian who who does not love others is pretty much useless. And I'm not talking about just uh, loving people that look like you and smell like you and dress like you and like me. I'm talking about loving, loving people who are different. You see, if as a church, we cannot love the guy that, that comes to church with tattoos. If we cannot love the, the, the gentleman that, that smells like he has been smoking if we cannot love the teen who is pregnant out of wedlock, if we cannot love the woman who has been trafficked and sold as a as a prostitute, if if we cannot love the the young man the the, the who is struggling with his sexuality, and, and please, I notice that now when I mention this, perhaps some of you are looking at me a little funny, and I want to make this clear: all of us who are adults. And who are watching right now uh, in this uh, special camp meeting broadcast. All of us at some point or another we have struggled with our sexuality. So we, if we cannot love the guy with the tattoos. If we cannot love the guy who has been smoking. If we cannot love the the teen who is pregnant out of wedlock, if we cannot love the woman who has been trafficked and sold as a prostitute, if we cannot love the young man who has been struggling with his sexuality, if we cannot love those who are not vegetarian, the question is, who are we going to love? What are we here for? And I want to make it clear. I want to make it clear. If the church of God does not love all sinners... It is not the church, and it is not of God. If the church of God does not love all sinners, it is not the church, and it is not of God. And perhaps you're saying, Pastor, but does that mean that anything goes? We are Adventists. Where do we draw the line? And, and I'm here to tell you today, we draw the line where Jesus drew the line when he was brought to the woman that had been caught in the in the act of adul adultery. Jesus forgave her and he told her, uh, go and sin no more. Uh, and my question to you is, what would have Jesus done if the woman that had been caught in the act of adultery and, and, and he had forgiven would have been brought back to him? Would he have forgiven her again? Of course he would have. So we're here as a church. That we might be able to love sinners. Let me let me let me ask you a question here. Which group of sinners was the group of sinners that Jesus rejected? Help me out. Type it on the chat. Which group of sinners was the group of sinners that Jesus rejected? That's right. Jesus did not reject any groups of sinners at all. Any. The, the Pharisees, he treated them a little bit rougher than everybody else because they, they, they always mistreated uh, other sinners. But, but Jesus even dedicated time to Nicodemus in the middle of the night. Jesus loved even the Pharisees. So as a church, we are allowed to reject the same groups of sinners that Jesus rejected. And that is none. We are not allowed to reject any groups of sinners because Jesus loved 
all groups of sinners. And now let me ask you another question. Which groups of sinners were the ones that Jesus loved? That's right, I just said it. Jesus loved all sinners. So as a church, we have a responsibility of loving all groups of sinners. All sinners. We are supposed to love them as well. I want to read this quote. It is a quote that I found very interesting. And I want to share, them, uh, share this quote with you today. It's written by Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. In his book, God in Search of Man, a Philosophy of Judaism. And it says there, It is customary to blame secular science and anti-religious philosophy for the eclipse of religion in modern society. It would be more honest to blame religion for its own defeats. Religion declined not because it was refuted, but because it became irrelevant, dull, oppressive, insipid. When faith is completely replaced by creed, worship by discipline, love by habit, when the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past, when faith becomes a heirloom rather than a living mountain, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with a voice of compassion, it mes its message becomes meaningless. So yes, my dear brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters in Alaska and wherever you may be watching us from, we are here that we might be able that we might be able to love others like Jesus did. And I wonder, uh, what has happened to us? Could it be that in our desire to do what is good, in our desire to maintain our religion pure and our church clean, that we have forgotten about Jesus and what he's all about? Could it be that in order to maintain an identity that has been passed down to us, that we have become the people of tradition rather than the people of Jesus, the people of love? Could it be that we have misunderstood our call to revival and reformation? And I, I want to say one thing here. I, I travel across North America uh, for years now. Uh, lately, I have been traveling virtually, uh, preaching and speaking at camp meetings and different types of gatherings, and church services, like I'm doing today with you. And usually as I go across North America, uh, there is a phrase that I hear. Um, I'm sure you have heard the phrase uh, as well, revival and, that's right, reformation. But, but there is something that, that happens every time that I hear this phrase. I hear uh, when people talk about revival and reformation, I hear people refer, uh, refer to two or three things, maybe four. Every time I, I hear people talk about revival and reformation, and I know this does not happen in Alaska, it's everywhere else. Uh, I hear people talk about revival and reformation, and they are referring to, to dress. I hear people talking about revival and reformation, and they are referring to diet. I, I hear people talk about revival and reformation, and they refer to, to music. And when I go across North America, and I hear people talk about revival and reformation, I even hear people talk about perfection at times. But, but I want to be very clear with you today, my brother and my sister. If I go to the Gospels. I can tell by reading the Gospels that people did not follow Jesus. People did not love Jesus because of his dress. As a matter of fact, the Bible says very little about Jesus and dress. People did not follow Jesus because of his dress. Let me go a little further. People did not follow Jesus because of his diet. Yeah, let me, let me break it to you, and, and perhaps you knew this, but, but there are some people who have been very surprised when I have told them that, that Jesus was not a vegetarian. And, and please, when I say this, I don't want anybody to think that I'm not in favor of a healthy lifestyle. I, I have been vegan uh, the majority of my life. I, only, I, I am not vegan when I go to New York because I, I love New York pizza, all right? So, but in most cases, I'm, I'm vegan. I am a vegetarian. I have been vegan, but, but Jesus was not. 
So people did not follow Jesus because of his, because of his diet. And let me go a little bit further. Jesus was not followed. Jesus was not loved because of his taste of music. I know this does not happen in Alaska, but across North America, we still have one too many churches that spend all year arguing about music. And when we're arguing about music and about worship and about how do we worship God best, when we argue about this, there is only one person that wins, and that is Satan. Because when we're arguing and fighting, we're not worshiping. And we're not giving God the, the, the worship and the adoration that he deserves. People did not follow Jesus because of his dress. People did not follow Jesus because of his diet. People did not follow Jesus because of his preference of music. And, and, and one last thing, people did not follow Jesus because of his perfection. Let me ask you one thing. When was the last time that you told someone that you're better than they are and they continue to like you? Ha! People did not follow Jesus because of his perfection. And by now you're probably asking yourself, Pastor Jose, is it that you don't believe in perfection? Let me tell you one thing. I do believe in perfection. And I cannot wait till the day I am perfect. That is why one of my favorite Bible verses in Scripture is a Bible verse that says that He who began the great work in you, He will continue to work in you till the day of His coming. There will be a day when you and I will be perfect, and that is the day of the second coming of Jesus. That is the reason why I cannot wait to the second coming of Jesus. But people did not follow Jesus because of His perfection, and He's the only one that has walked this earth that could have claimed perfection. But that was not even the reason why people follow him. So now you ask the question. So pastor. If people did not follow Jesus because of his dress. If people did not follow Jesus because of his diet. If people did not follow Jesus because of his music. His taste of music. Or because of his perfection. Why did people follow Jesus? Why did people love Jesus? Very simple. People. Follow Jesus. People love Jesus simply because Jesus loved people. Amen. If we want people to follow us, if we want people to love us, if we want people to come to our churches, if we want people to enjoy our fellowship, we must be able to love the people around us, period. People love Jesus because Jesus loved people. And I would like to suggest today that the biggest revival and reformation that our church in North America needs today, the biggest revival and reformation that our church in Alaska needs today has nothing to do with dress and with diet and with perfectionism. It has nothing to do with taste of music. The biggest revival and reformation that our church needs today is to have churches that are filled with youth, with young adults, with children, and with adults who are filled with the love of God and the compassion of Jesus. Amen? Ah. And let me go a little bit further. Listen to me, please. If you don't have the love of God in your heart, and if you're not willing to share the compassion of Jesus with others, please do not tell anyone that you're an Adventist. Because you will be giving God a bad name and you will bring reproach upon our church. And there is something that I would like to add here. A religion, a church, without love, a church that doesn't love people, a church that doesn't love sinners, is useless and no one cares for it. Pastor, well, you're being hard. I know, I know it sounds hard. But, but I want to I wanna say it again. A, a religion, a church that does not care for sinners, that does not love sinners, is useless and no one cares for it. Let's go to our Bibles. To 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1. And it says there, Though I speak, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have no love, I have become sounding brass, and a clanging cymbal. Something like this. That's right. 
And you can say, yeah, but, but I pray two or three hours per day. Uh, let me tell you one thing, my brother, my sister. If, if we pray two or three hours a day, but, but we do not love people around us, uh, what God hears is this. Yeah, but I keep the Sabbath and uh, make sure that I keep it from Friday night to Saturday night, from sundown to sundown. If you do that, but you spend your time condemning and judging others, this is all that God hears. Yeah, but, but, but I pray and I study my Bible and I make sure that I eat healthy. And, and if you do that, but you look down on other sinners, this is all that God hears. That's right, my brother. That's right, my sister. It is time to have a church that loves people with their mistakes and with their sins because Jesus did not come to this earth to save and to seek the perfect. Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. And if we are the church of Jesus, and if we're going to follow the example of Jesus, and if we're going to be Jesus to the people around us, we need to love them in the most difficult moments when they need us most. That's right. Like the song says, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Uh, not just for some, but for everyone. That's right. That's what the church needs now. That's what the world needs now. Love, sweet love. The sweet love of Jesus. And, and, and that song, in the, one part of it, it says that, that we don't need more mountains to climb. That we have plenty of mountains and hillsides and more than enough to climb. And it says that, that we do not need rivers or oceans to cross. That we have enough of them to, to last till the end of time. And I want to add one more thing. We have an awesome package of beliefs as a church. But I want to add today that, that we have that awesome package of doctrines and beliefs we do not need more doctrines or beliefs in our church we have enough what we need now is more love the sweet love of jesus for sinners in need and i close with this a few years ago i found myself it was a sunday morning and i found myself at a baseball stadium i was there because i was going to ready to watch my favorite baseball player play. And some of you are wondering, who is Pastor Jose's favorite baseball player? Um, take, a, take a guess. No, it's not Derek Jeter. It was a few years ago, so it could have been him, but it's not him. No, it is not Big Papi. That's right. It's not, a, not even Alex Rodriguez. That's right. Not, not even Aaron. Uh, my favorite baseball player, let me just tell you, is Jose Cortez III. And he was about seven years old at the time, and he was there ready to, to play a game of Little League. And uh, he started as a pitcher. He did an awesome job. Stroke out six. The six people that he faced, he struck them out. After that, they moved them. You know, they moved the little kids to different positions. They wanted to make sure that they learned to play the different positions of the game. And I remember that he came uh, to bat. And when he came to bat, he hit the ball real far between center field and right field. And he ran all the way from home plate to third base. He had a big slide on third base. It was a triple, one of the most difficult hits to, to do in baseball. I was clapping and enjoying myself and jumping up and down on, on, the, on the bleachers. And perhaps some people were thinking I was a little crazy. I was just enjoying that my son was doing well. Then they put him to play shortstop. And during that inning, the other team filled the bases. What does that mean? That they had a kid in first base, another kid in second base, another kid in third base, and the biggest player from the opposing team came to bat. It was an opportunity for the opposing team to do some damage. You know, and the, the opposing team always has a kid that is bigger than all the kids. Uh, that kid looked like he was four or five years older than all the other kids. He looked strong and big and... And someone that could hit the ball real far. Everyone moved back when he came. My son was playing shortstop. So on the first pitch, he hit the ball real hard. It was a line drive. And it was going right over my son's head. So just as the ball was going over his head, my son reached up, jumped up. And with the tip of his glove, he caught the ball. 
ha, that was one out. Then he noticed that the kid from second was going to third, and my son ran to him and tagged them. That was two outs. And then with the corner of his eye, he noticed that the kid that was going from second to second hadn't been able to go back to first base yet. And, and my son ran after him, and he tagged them. Later on, I asked them, why didn't you throw the ball to the second baseman? And he said, Papa, sometimes little kids don't know how to play well. So I was afraid that if I threw the ball to the second baseman, that he was going to drop it. So I made sure that I tagged them myself. That was a triple play, three outs, without assistance, done by my son. Ha! Ah, the, the, the most difficult play in baseball, my son had just done it. I was excited. I was jumping up and down. I was clapping for him. Even the, the parents from the opposing team were giving me high fives. It was awesome. Then the end of the game came. And now my son was playing first base. The opposing team was hitting. It was their last chance. There were two outs. And to bad came a kid by the name of Ethan. Awesome kid with awesome parents. Ethan, it seems that he was born with, with his left hand a little bit shorter, left arm a little bit shorter than his right arm, and his left leg a little bit shorter than his right leg. So Ethan has difficulty to run. He has difficulty to grab the bat and to hit. His parents are so awesome, and Ethan is so awesome. They have made sure that he grows up believing that nothing is impossible. And as a matter of fact, we need more people like that in church. People that see our kids and our young people when they are being challenged, and rather than putting them down or, or, or trying to discourage them, encourage them and say, you guys can do this. We need more people like that in church. So Ethan came to hit. I put my head down, began to work on my, on my phone. There were two outs. He was the last person uh, to bat. Uh, the first pitch came, it was high. Ethan made a low swing, did not even come close to the ball, strike one. Second pitch came high as well. Ethan made another swing with an effort. It was hard for him. Strike two, did not even come close to the ball. Then something happened that paralyzed the game. As I had my head down texting on my phone, I heard a voice, a voice that looked very familiar, sounded very familiar. Ethan, hit that ball. Ethan, you can do it. Ethan, go ahead. I looked up and there he was. That's right. It was my boy, Jose. He was cheering Ethan, the player from the opposing, opposing team. The opposite team. Ethan, you can hit that ball. Ethan, you can do it. By now, the whole game had stopped. The coaches from both teams had come up. Uh, they, they came up on the, on, the, on the dugout, and they were leaning against the fence looking at what was taking place in front of their eyes with tears on, on their faces. Uh, the parents around me had also tears on their faces. And, and Jose kept going, Ethan, go ahead, hit that ball, hit it hard. The only one that didn't seem to be enjoying the moment was the pitcher in, in, in my son's team. He's looking at my son, staring at him, and kind of as if he was trying to say, you're supposed to be cheering for me. You're supposed to tell me we can do this. And you're cheering the, the batter in the opposing team. What's going on? But my son did not care. He kept going, Ethan, go ahead. Hit it hard. Ethan, hit the ball out of here. The game finished. And my son came up to me at the end of, after, like he does at the end of every game, and he said, Papa, uh, how did I do today? And I told him, baby, you did an awesome job. You're a great player. I wish I had been half as good uh, as you are when I was your age. Yeah, you're the best. He smiled, looked at me very excited and happy, and he said what well, he says all the time. He asked the same question up to this day. And out of everything that I did today, which part do you like the most? most so I looked at him he looked at me and he said Papa I know which part you like the most you like the one where uh, where I uh, stroke everybody out you love that and I said that was great but that wasn't my favorite 
Okay, Papa, I know you like the one in which I hit the ball all the way out there to the outfield and I made it all the way to third base. Do you like my slide? And I said, that was awesome. You're not supposed to slide at this age. But yeah, that was good. But that was not my favorite play. Then he looked at me and he said, oh, oh okay, I know. You loved it when I did the triple play uh, without assistance, all by myself, caught that ball and tagged those two guys. That was three outs, Papa. I bet that was your favorite play. And I said, baby, that was great. But that was not my favorite play. Then he looked at me as if saying, so what do I have to do to impress you? What, what, what do I have to do? How come you did not think that any of those three, what else, what else did I do? I looked at him and I said, baby, out of everything that you did today, you know what I like the most? What I love the most was when you cheer for Ethan. The boy in the opposite team. I think that was the best thing that you did today. And he looked at me, a little confused, and he said, Really, Papa? And I said, Yes, baby. That was the best. That was the best thing that you did today. And I think that that was what God loved most about what you did. When you shared the player in the opposite team. My dear brother, my dear sister. I just want to tell you as I close, God loves it when you read the Bible. It's awesome reading the Bible. God loves it when you pray. It is awesome to talk to Him. It is awesome to read the Bible. God loves it when, when you worship Him on the Sabbath together with the church community, be it physically or virtually like we're doing now. Uh, God loves it. Uh, when you worship and when you hear his word and when you sing with your, with your brothers and sisters in church. He loves it when you dress nice to go to church. He loves it when, when you eat healthy and when you have a healthy lifestyle. He loves all of those things. All of those things are really important. But do you want God to be really proud of you? Do you want Jesus to be so proud of you and super happy with you? Love others. Love others even when they are different. Even when they do things that you know are not right. Love others who sin in different ways that uh, that uh, different to yours. Love others even they they might not speak like you and go to church with you. Love others even when they are doing things that you know that, that, that are not right. Love them. Be the eyes and the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus to those others. When you do that, God is so proud of you. And when you do that, you do not only tell them that they are worth and that they are valued and that they are loved and you make them belong and you make them feel good, but you're also telling them that you're not alone, that you are with Jesus, that you are a disciple of Jesus. So as I close today, I want to ask you to make a commitment, not with Pastor Kevin Miller or with Melvin Santos or with Tobin Dodge, Make a commitment with God, not with me, with God. Would you like to be the type of Christian, the type of Seventh-day Adventist who loves people? Uh, the eyes and the hands and the feet of Jesus and the heart of Jesus, wherever you are. If you would like to be a Seventh-day Adventist, a Christian who loves people, that people may feel their worth and their value and that they might know that you are not alone, that you are with Jesus, that they are in the presence of a disciple of Jesus, that they might feel attracted to your church, uh, they may feel attracted to, to your family, to you because of how you treat them and how you love them. If you want to be that type of Christian, contagious Christian, contagious Adventist, who loves people like Jesus did, I would like you for you to type down in the chat, I would... I, I want to love people. I will love people. I know it is not easy, but you can do it with the help of God. So if you like to, to, to accept this challenge, if you want to accept that appeal, just make sure that you chat right there in your chat, in Facebook, YouTube, Zoom, that you put in the chat, I will love people with the help of God. When you love people, you are an example of Jesus. You're an example of what a disciple of Jesus is. And you give people the opportunity to see Jesus in ways in which they would never have the opportunity before. 
So if you want to do that, this is the moment. Please just type it on your chat. But I have an, one more question that I want to ask. And that other question is for those of you who have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior yet. If you haven't been baptized, if you're not a part of a church family, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior yet, I want you to know that Jesus loves you, that He forgives you, and that He wants you to be part of His family. So in the name of Jesus, I want to talk to you right now, and I want to say it's okay to make a decision for Jesus today. If you haven't accepted Him as Lord and Savior and haven't been baptized yet, just type in the chat. If you feel that the Holy Spirit is talking to you right now, type in the chat, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I would like to be baptized. I want to be baptized. Just type it in the chat right there on Facebook, YouTube, Zoom. And one of our pastors from Alaska will reach out to you. Uh, we'll perhaps have a virtual visit with you. Talk a little bit and perhaps very soon, one of these days in the future, you will be able to be baptized. So if you haven't made that decision for Jesus and you want to be a part of a family that is a family that is filled with the love of God and the compassion of Jesus, the body of Christ, the church, this is the time to make that decision. It could be the most important decision of your life. It is okay to do it today. I'm praying as I speak that you will accept it and that you will make that decision to become a part of a body of Christ, a part of a family of Christ, a part of a church family that loves people like Jesus did. So just type on your chat, I want to be baptized. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And someone will be in touch with you. At this point, I want to close. And I want to pray for you as I close. Dear God, I thank you for those who have made a decision that they want to love like you. Holy Spirit, please give them the strength to be able to do that. It is not easy. Help them to love even the un unlovable, not only in the family, in the church, in the neighborhood. Uh, help us to love those that need your special love in a very special way today. Thank you for giving us the desire to love others and help us to do so. But at the same time, Lord, I want to pray in a very special way for those who are making the decision to give their lives to you today. That this decision will be firm, strong, and that very soon, they will join our church. They will join our, our family, a family of love, by going into the waters of baptism, baptism and being baptized. Thank you for each one. A double portion of your Holy Spirit to all. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.